Once upon a time, a very, very long time ago, this was you and this was me, 525 million years ago, before there was any life on land at all, in the warm primordial sea, our great-great-grandmother darted from the claws of ancient sea scorpions. Her name is Heiko Wichthys, and she is the first creature in Earth's history to have the primitive spinal column. And this unique, soft, eel-like, undulating body, it allows her to swim faster than anything else in the sea. And so she thrives, and she has lots of babies, and her babies have lots of babies. And in time, she becomes the great-great-grandmother of every fish, and every frog, and every lizard, every dinosaur and every bird in the sky, and the mammals, like the cats and the dogs, and us, this strange, hairless primate. But to find our inner hycoichthys can be kind of tricky. Yeah, I mean, our bodies are often stiff from the repetitive strains of our modern lives, and even for us dancers, yeah, we're used to tough postures and movements, but to find hycoichthys, ah, we have to relax every muscle along the spine, vertebrae by vertebrae, allowing us to undulate, swimming forwards, our little jawless mouth gaping and sucking up precious oxygen from the water through our gills. Ah, this is the dance of our greatest grandmother. Hmm. Ah, that fundamental question of human identity, that who am I that frames our entire orientation to life and to self, now we often approach that question through tracing our ethnic and cultural ancestry. And yeah, that, that's deeply valid. But how many generations can you count? And why stop counting? The science of paleontology studies fossils traces of ancient organisms caught in rock that tell an epic story of our shared evolutionary ancestry, hundreds of millions of years in the making. Yeah, the story might seem too vast or too distant to be relevant to our modern lives, but in fact, the story is written into our very instincts and emotions. It's written into the anatomy and movement of our bodies. And as a choreographer and artistic director, hmm, this offers a treasure trove of possibilities. And so prehistoric body theater was born. Now, I've been living here in Indonesia for the last seven years uh, as a student of dance and culture and the Indonesian language, and also as a creative artist working alongside my friends here and the great diversity of experimental and traditional art communities found across the archipelago. So I stumbled across the idea for prehistoric body theater while researching the variety of Indonesian dances found across the archipelago which represent animal characters. And yeah, you can see a couple of examples here. Uh, first with Mika here, to show a little bit of the Tariburung Enggang, or the hornbill dance from the Dayak cultures of Borneo. Or here, Aji, he's showing the wonky character from the Ramayana from the Central Javanese Dance Theater. And here, Alan's showing a little bit of another Ramayana character, the mythical bird Jatayu. And these dances, they point to deep, long-standing traditions of embodied relationships to animals here in the archipelago, taken both as mythological characters, like guys, or symbolic aspects of the human psyche. Yeah, they're so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And also, they're in relation to real animals with whom which we share our world. So, for sure, I've been on a deep dive into Indonesian life over the last few years. But while living here, I never really lost my childhood passion for paleontology. Because, yeah, I mean, I was that typical dinosaur-obsessed kid, and even some of my earliest drawings from when I'm three years old are of dinosaur bones that I copied from books. And I've always kept up with the latest discoveries. 
So while I was learning about these dances here in Indonesia, I was also keeping up with the latest discoveries of feathered dinosaur fossils from China. Remember Velociraptor from Jurassic Park? That one with that raised sickle claw on its foot? Well, it didn't really look like it did in the movies. In fact, we now know that Velociraptor looked a little bit more like this. Yeah, Velociraptor had feathered wings on its hands, and it had a fan of beautiful feathers at the tip of its tail. And this here, this is called a Microraptor. It's one of the newer raptor dino dis dinosaur discoveries from China. And it has feathered wings on both its hands and its feet. Maybe it allowed it to glide, something like a biplane, dive bombing its prey from the trees. In a Microraptor, it's not a bird, but it's a close dinosaur cousin of birds, one of several families of feathered dragons which share a common ancestor with birds as we know them today. So I was looking at this fossil a few years ago, and I couldn't help feeling that it, it struck a, an interesting resemblance to some of the Indonesian dances that I was learning. And it got me to wondering, hmm, could we build a raptor dinosaur dance? So I started to experiment. Hmm. Hmm. The strong grounded legs, elegant fingers, and intricate rhythms of Indonesian traditional dance, yet yeah, they seem to offer a, a strong technical foundation to create some sort of raptor dinosaur dance. But tradition, it's not a plaything, especially for a foreigner like me. So perhaps there's another way. Remember Heiko Ichthys, our great grandmother with the spine? Well, she's also the great-grandmother of the raptor dinosaurs, and as fellow vertebrates, we share much in common. Now, if you compare a human body to a raptor body, we both have two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. On a neck, connected with shoulders, on a torso, with arms and hands, legs and feet, and a tail. Of course, ours is a lot shorter, but it follows the same design. And so I, I began to work with mentor paleontologists to map the postures and locomotion and theoretical behavior of prehistoric animals directly to the human body. And this creates a, a cool and, and maybe even objective way of creating a choreography. But if I really wanted to become a dinosaur on stage, I needed to find a, a living dinosaur to teach me. But fortunately, here in Indonesia, we're surrounded by dinosaurs every day. <laughs> so this is one of the earlier prehistoric body theater experiments back from 2016 on the remote Indonesian island of Madura. And there, yeah, we tried to dive into what is it like to be a chicken. But we studied the chicken not just as a chicken, but as a descendant of the only kind of dinosaur to survive the last mass extinction in Earth's history. For 66 million years ago, a massive asteroid 
struck the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico with the force of a billion atomic bombs. And that impact, it sent waves of molten rock up the height of the Himalayas like ripples in a pond. And as tsunamis ricocheted all around the globe, vaporized rock was shot out into outer space where it congealed into little balls of glass. Scientists called them tektites, which rained down into the atmosphere as the greatest show of shooting stars that eyes have ever seen. And the air, it grew hotter and hotter. On that day, the whole world burned. Now, the Hell Creek Formation in eastern Montana, not so far from where I'm from in the USA, it's a fossil site which captures a world from just before, during, and after this dramatic moment in Earth's history. What is now dry desert was once wet, steamy forest on the banks of a giant prehistoric ocean. And there in Hell Creek, 66 million years ago, famous dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex roamed the landscape and Triceratops. And this magnificent creature, which is not a dinosaur, it's a pterosaur, a flying cousin of the dinosaurs, which stood as tall as a giraffe. Its name is Quetzalcoatlus. It's the largest flying creature that ever lived. But on that fateful day, these beautiful animals were wiped from the face of the earth forever. But think about this. Every plant and every animal around us here is the descendant of the survivors of that asteroid. We are the descendant of the survivors of that asteroid. And so in 2017, I got to join the paleontologists at Hell Creek as an artist in residence. And there I got to work alongside the scientists, getting a crash course in paleontology and how it works in the field. Did you know that fossil bone, it, it sticks to the tongue? And it's actually kind of hard to tell the difference between a rock and a fossil when you're out in the field, it's all dusty. So, I'm not kidding, day after day, we have 50 full-grown professionals crawling on their hands and knees through the desert, picking up every little pebble and putting it in their mouths. <laughs> For science, right? <laughs> but there in Hell Creek, I also got to dig up the bones of a T-Rex. And as I sat there, day after day, brushing away layers of clay from these monstrous ribs and jaws and claws. I was struck by this, this shiver. I was sitting there with this monstrous beast, the way it died in this river, feeling the reality of, of its world. And I was struck by this emotion that I can only call awe in the face of deep time. And so I was inspired to work with the paleontologists from Hell Creek to help me choreograph a main stage production for a prehistoric body theater. And we call this Ghosts of Hell Creek. And Ghosts of Hell Creek, it tells an epic story spanning 500 million years centered around this asteroid impact. And Ghosts of Hell Creek, it stars a Caraptor. Caraptor is the last of the magnificent, elegant, fierce, feathered raptor dinosaurs who prowled the jungles of Hell Creek. And in Ghosts of Hell Creek, we celebrate a Caraptor's life through love dances and hunting dances, nesting dances. And finally, we eulogize her death, her total annihilation from the world in that blazing inferno. But then, Ghost of Hell Creek goes on to celebrate a miracle. For in Hell Creek, we find the bones of the earliest primate in the fossil record, called Purgatorius. And Purgatorius used the first thumb to ever see day to grab the first fleshy fruit in the fossil record. And so, Purgatorius thrived on that juicy fruit and had lots of babies. And their babies had babies. And voila, here we are. 
So I have a dream of sharing this story with audiences around the world. So I've been working with my friends here to build Ghosts of Hell Creek into an international touring production with a primarily Indonesian dance ensemble. Why work with Indonesian dancers specifically? Well, the elegance and strength of Indonesian traditional techniques have been a major inspiration for how we choreograph this piece. And also here in the archipelago, there's an absolutely unique artistic spirit, which over the last few years I've been immersed in and feel forever connected to now. And my dancer friends here, they're coming from very rich cultural and spiritual heritages, which have a very different perspective on human identity and the natural world than the evolutionary perspective. And so by working both with Indonesian dancers and Western-trained paleontologists, Prehistoric Body Theater is opening up an unprecedented kind of conversation between science and world culture on our identities and origins through the medium of art. I believe that paleontology offers a powerful empathy medicine for our times, an awe-inspiring story from which our very bodies and emotions and instincts arose. Could we enter into a kind of prehistoric consciousness together, conjuring a perspective wherein our nations, our cultures, our boundaries and borders have not yet formed? Can we dance in deep time together, honoring our ancestors and the lessons that they offer us while we dream of how to touch the stars? Thank you. Mm. Mm -hmm.